for the XLR and leadership series. Uh, today we have Mr. MBS Murthy with us from Future Group to address uh, all of us. Uh, now I would like to welcome Arun to give the uh, welcome address. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to present to you Mr. MBS Murthy, Vice President, Chief People Office, Future Value Retail Limited, Future Group. Murthy sir did his Bachelor of Science from Andhra University. He went on to pursue Diploma in Export Management at AIMA and he later completed his Masters in Human Resources from Symbiosis. He is currently pursuing Doctorate in Philosophy from Pacific University with a thesis topic of Impact of Human Capital Analytics on HR decision making to improve organizational effectiveness. Murthy sir has over 24 years of diverse professional experience spanning areas such as pharmaceuticals and IT and IT enabled services. After spending a sizable time in sales and marketing, he stepped into HR. He has worked with repeated MNCs in this journey. To name a few, we have Pfizer, Novartis, Dr. Reddy. He has special interest in soft skills training, coaching and leadership models. He specializes in strategic HR, workforce planning, channel sales management, CRM, negotiations and many such niche areas. He loves long drives and spending time with his kids. He is passionate about playing the violin and is very active in social work. His key deliverables in the current role are HR strategy, operations talent acquisition, management and development and management information systems. I am honored to welcome Murthy sir in XLRI to present his views on leadership in talent age. Murthy sir, please. Good morning. Good morning. So wonderful to be here. Nice to see you all. And uh, so wonderful to be at the campus for the second time in less than a decade. I think this will make me mobile. Great. So I have everything around me to help me move along and probably if I come close to you. So uh, nice to see you as I said already and I hope all of you are fine. So once again let's say very good morning to all of us. Good morning. Good morning. Great. So uh, I was literally chased by Pradeep for quite some time and he ensured that I am around to talk uh, whatever I you know gathered to put behind me in the last 25 odd years. Should be about this talk together. Ah I didn't know they do meet each other. Good. So uh, thanks Pradeep for having me here. And uh, it's, it's better late than ever, so I thought 25 should be the right day in. So what I'm going to do is uh, take you through what I gathered in my last 25 years on a journey and as my, as Arun has already briefed, that I come from a pedigree of sales and marketing in pharma and then transition into IT and retail part to which I currently I belong to. So that's been quite a journey. Yeah? So before I get into uh, my session, I would like to do a small activity with you all. Will you be with me? Yes, yes sir. sir. Great. Comfortable? Yes, yes, sir. Please raise your hands. Either left or right. Anyone will do. Spread your fingers wide. Okay? Just the way I am doing it. Close these two fingers, the index and the thumb. Exactly the way. Preferably try to make a circle. Yeah? <coughs> the way I have done here and then please bring this slowly towards your face please bring it slowly towards your face 
Now listen to me very carefully. Please bring it slowly towards your face to your chin. Ah, here is the catch. Where is your chin? I'm not at fault. I said, listen to me very carefully. It happens. Don't blame yourself. It happens with all of us. And uh, why I do this? So I ensure the next 40 minutes or so you are with me. We don't do these mistakes. Right? Great. So, uh, this is way, this is how I will move forward. You know, I will talk a little bit about my own pyramid. This is not copied from anywhere. This is something which the life has taught me. And uh, I would like to touch upon one important element from the pyramid that is self-mastery, which I always believed in. And as I was talking to Sir, Mr. Madhu, I also heard a lot that this institute has several professors who worked on personal effectiveness for quite a long time. So this is again an important area which I thought I could share with you. And one of the important competency which I, I believe in and I would want all of you all to believe in is coaching. A little bit of thoughts on coaching. And my the conceptually the most important thing I believe in practice is situation leadership. Most of you all would have heard about it, right? Yeah? And is there anybody who has been professionally trained on situation leadership? I better understand this because I don't talk something which is which has not been which has been taught otherwise. Okay? And then uh, finally my own uh, formula 3D to how do you actually you know address your life or the way forward. And then we'll have some time for the Q and A's at the later part of the session, right? So I start with my pyramid. Uh, though I call it a pyramid, I don't have a three-dimensional image here, so I beg your pardon. But nevertheless, let's focus on what's being discussed. The first building block of this pyramid is self-discipline mastery, which I told I dwell upon a little more going forward. I think uh, since most of you or all of you come from a very good industry background and you have chosen to go through this this course and the curriculum to ensure that you you know kickstart your careers and or maybe take them to a different level. I think it's very important for all of us to achieve a very good control on the self. And that's a starting point and something which I believe in. And if you would have uh, imagined how I managed to change over my careers. Probably this is one area which helped me a lot. You know, it helped me a lot because I carry an immense amount of self-discipline, which I, uh, through a personal effectiveness program, I ensured that I mastered over it a period of time, over a period of time. The other important element I would like to talk about is interpersonal effectiveness. Now, who in this world will not agree with that interpersonal skills is important? I don't think. But it's easier said than done, especially in your in the corporate world, or be it in your uh, if you choose to become your an entrepreneur. I think interpersonal skills and its effectiveness is very important. I strongly believe in it, and I continuously attempt to build upon these interpersonal skills. And you have the world of web to teach you how to go about with this. Do your own search. Get pick up the best possible concepts around it. And try to leverage on it and live in it. So it will ensure you to go to the effectiveness group as far as your interpersonal skills is concerned. Okay? And third, which is according to me, third integral part of an internal environment of each of us would be the techno-functional competence. Right? So whatever skills and competencies you've been trained upon, ensure that you know the competency levels are at the best. And the learning is eternal, as everybody talked about it, and I also am a strong believer. But whatever you have, ensure that it is at the best of the levels, so you are able to deliver to the best capabilities and potential at all times. So the third important internal element in terms of the self-discipline and mastery is, I believe, in techno-functional competency. Why don't you all sit down? I'm going to talk a little long, seriously. <laughs> yeah. That's comfortable. <coughs> and uh, I put in two elements in the external environment. Is, is everything fine so far? 
Am I talking bookish or make some sense? I'm glad to hear that. So the next two elements that I put in as external, but you know, there's a lot to do with the internal environment as well, is change. And somebody has rightly said it, it's constant, change is constant. I think, uh, again, I, as I told you, I managed to change from one industry into the another industry, not to just get a feeling of a sense of achievement that, yeah, this is something I managed, let me tell the whole world. But you know, there's something driven, driving me internally, passionate, look at, you know, trying to learn something new all the time or experiment with something new has actually driven me to this decision. And I, I gladly made the decision. I didn't for a moment look back at any point in my life. So that's something changed in one area, as I gave you an example, is something you should always look at, an external factor, but a lot of integ internal integration to it. And last but not the least, challenge the status quo. So it's like the child, you know, you give him a chocolate, he would crave for the second one. If you hadn't given for the, the first one, the chocolate idea would not have come in his mind, right? So it's challenge the status quo. If you have something, I know the old adage, a bird in hand is better than two in the bush. That's good for some reference at some point. But always try to get something more by challenging your status quo. Try to get something new, something, you know, uh, or, or a continuous passionate outlook. And I think this is the second fifth element of my external environment under this my pyramid which I wanted to talk to you all today about. Okay? Purely, this is my thought process. I think if you can pick up a few and dwell upon it, it will help you a lot. And I'm sure each one of you would also have your own outlook and way of looking at life, right? So this is where, what I wanted to talk about uh, in my therapy. Can you recognize this lady? Okay. Now what do you see out here? Don't tell me, don't tell your neighbors. So you see something, a lady, right? And who exactly it is? Is it the young lady? Young lady or the old lady? Why? Some of y'all would have seen the young lady. Some of y'all would have seen the old lady. Uh, I, I didn't mean, I, could, I didn't have a better photograph, so, so ladies, excuse me. Uh, so I thought this is the best photograph to project out here. Uh, why, why does it happen? Some of y'all look at a young lady and some of y'all, some of us would look at an old lady. Why does this happen? It's our own perceptions. It's our own perceptions. And how do these perceptions form? You can you preconceive some biases and some understanding. So what is this perceptions or perceiving and an understanding and then what does it all talk about? It talks about paradigm, an important element in our life. So a paradigm is a way an individual will perceive, understand and interpret the surrounding world. So why are we talking about paradigm? In this context, what, how does it make a difference? I think it's important to go back to those images, very important, because when you are interacting with the outside world, you know, there is a constant paradigm build-up, breaking of paradigms, formation of new paradigms, and it is a continuous process. I think it's important to understand this, to understand the light in a better way. Yeah? Especially when you are interacting with the outside world, you must appreciate that each of us would have a paradigm of their own. So if somebody, some of us would have seen the young lady, they are right in their own way. If some of us have seen the old lady, you are right in your own way. Right? Either of you are right. But it's important to understand and respect the viewpoint of the opposite individual. So each of the things could be two or three considerations or point of views. Please remember that because the next part of my slide is what I'm going to talk about self mastery with specific reference to the seven habits of highly effective. <coughs> How many of you have read this book? Stephen Covey, I think, 
such an impactful person in all of our lives. I'm glad that some of you all have seen this book. And I'm sure you will have your own paradigm after having read this book. And I'm sure you will see and appreciate my paradigm as well also when I talk to you about the seven habits. Okay, so uh, before I get into those, uh, uh, what's written up in this slide, I think this seven habits of highly effective people, <coughs> Stephen Covey tried to, you know, go how we do or we look at the things from a perspective of a dependence to an independence to an interdependence. Okay, so that's how the seven habits play around. And in the first three habits of be proactive, begin with the end in mind, put first things first. Stephen Covey talked about a private victory. That's, you know, a personal effectiveness. And in the, the, the next three set of practices or the uh, habits, think win-win, seek to understand, then to be understood, understood and synergize, he talked about public victory. And then something which encompasses all this will be the sharp and the soft. So, this is a very important and very inspiring booklet in my life. Because when I am talking to you about these seven habits, I am not making a reference to the book alone. I am making with a very, very, I am in fact make a confession that, you know, this book helped me to put a lot of things into a nice perspective in my own personal life. And that's important for you to understand. So I don't necessarily advocate you to buy and read this book of practice and principle, but what I'm trying to impress you today is about how the seven habits could be giving you some way, way, of, way forward or looking to your life going forward. So when you talk about be proactive, let me take the let me take the other part of it, the reactive. If you see, most of our lives are filled with reactive behaviors, isn't it? I'm sure the bulk or the larger part of our life is built with reactive behaviors. Why does this happen? Because we are not in control of our lives. It's as simple as that. But can we get, can we always be proactive? <coughs> I'm sure it may not be possible as well. So try to bring about a balance, reduce your reactive behaviors and try to be more proactive. Than proactive. That's what I could say. And this is possible, again from a concept discussed in Seven Habits, each element can have two parts to it. You know, in terms of whether you talk about a task or a practice or an activity like this. It could have probably the two parts form. If it is depicted like a circle, you have the outer part of the circle, which is the circle of concern. And the inner part which is the circle of influence. Circle of concern is something we all focus and then we result in reactive behaviors. Where we don't have too much of control around it. The circle of influence is something we can definitely have a control and that's where you know more proactive behaviors can be put to be put forward. So I would urge upon you, if you have to practice being proactive, focus on the circle of influence areas rather than focus on circle of concern areas. Very simple example would be uh, Yesterday, when I was being driven from the Ranchi airport, so the guy, the driver kind of frightened me saying that, you know, this, uh, this, this road has a maximum number of accidents that do in the night. And, you know, he, he told me a hell lot of things about uh, the road and the goods and bags about it, which I had no control about. Yes, it was a concern area for me. How will I reach here safely? Because I want to definitely be here this morning. I want to meet you all. So I, I definitely was concerned, but I couldn't do much about it. Yes, there was something which I could influence upon my own behavior. So what I preferred to do is, I kind of practiced a little bit of meditation. I closed my eyes, which was difficult to do, you know, when you've got time and again the lights focusing from in the front. I closed my eyes and just thought, you know, what I would be doing today this morning, how I would be talking to you, or all, and what's happening back in my house in, with my family. So in a way I was able to you know, reduce and control my anxiety and that's my influence area definitely at that particular point. So if you look at life, we'll have two parts to it. This is an example which I'm just talking about since my yesterday's experience. If you look at life, I'm sure you'll, you'll have this 
circle of concern and circle of influence. And circle of influence is something which you can influence and have control on, and that will help you to keep more of proactive behaviors rather than reactive behaviors. Right? Okay, the second one is begin with the end in mind. I think the statement talks like this. Do you have a personal mission statement? Do you have your goals clearly written? I know I'm talking to all finest B schools and you're going to be a lot, lot better in terms of having your personal mission statement and goals than the, the janta, I'm sure. But do you have clear goals? Better late than never. If you don't have them, please write them down. It's very important. And that's what we begin with the end in mind is talking about. Have your personal mission statement and put everything behind that to drive on the cross of achieving that. Okay? Very important habit. It, it, try to get it as, as many times in the back of your mind or to the front of your mind and I'm sure it will help you to focus on your goals or kind of refine them on a continuous basis. The third one is put first things first. In general parlance again, time management. Know what is urgent, what is important, <coughs> dedicate your time and energy behind that. I think it's a challenge for all of us. Time management is very essential. Again, largely spoken, less practice. Have this, definitely I think if you look at this habit, put first things first and try to understand and separate out what is urgent and important and I'm sure you'll get the clarity and you'll be able to select the right scheme of things to start your work or engage yourself with it. Easy? So if you look at these three habits of being proactive, beginning with the end in mind or putting first things first, I'm sure you'll achieve a very good private victory. That's your a good control and effectiveness of your self. That's what we talked about, private victory, the first three habits. Now, if you want to change your paradigms around these habits, <coughs> how am I responsible for my time at, at college? I'm controlled by somebody else. That's how you see it. And what you do, you get out of it. But if you put it the other way around, if you see things in a better perspective, what you do, put me into a different, into a different situation or a scenario, and what you get would be a better control, well-controlled result out of it. So you need to look at your paradigms on a continuous basis while you're practicing these habits. So that's the relation with the paradigm and the habit. The fourth habit is think win-win. Can this happen? How many of you believe it can happen? Can you raise your hands? Good? Some of you all uh, chose not to raise your hand. Maybe there are their own paradigms. I don't, I, I won't say, I don't make any statement. I don't say that, but you have your own paradigms. So where does this come from? You look at the combinations, you look at the lose, lose, the net result is zero. You look at the other combination, win, lose. So somebody smiles and somebody cries. You look at lose, win, again the same thing in the reverse order. But if you look at win, win, you have practically everybody happy from the situation. It's nice to say, but does it happen? Yeah? It doesn't happen by accident, my dear friends. How much you are investing from your side is important. So first part of this, first part is believing that this can happen. You might often say that, yeah, I'm fine, I, I believe that win-win can happen. What if the other person doesn't understand that? Possible. You will still get a win-lose or a lose-win combination out of that. But imagine out of 10 such encounters, you have Two encounters where both the both the individuals or both the parties believe that win-win is possible. You have a twenty percent success rate. Not bad. Not bad. You are not at zero. So you can build a block one on one over the other. Twenty percent is good to start with, and slowly the more is better. And everybody thinks win-win is possible. I am sure 
the 20 percentile will go remarkably higher. Now this is a practical world, you can't imagine a 100 percent win win, but at least the politicians don't believe that, who rule the nation and who are kind of a guiding principle for all of us, but I'm sure your institute uh, leaders believe in that. They really believe in that, I'm sure. So there are occasions, there are situations, there are uh, areas and uh, areas where you know the win-win does happen. But I strongly believe this. If you think win-win to the maximum possible, you can make a difference to your own self and to the people around you. So this is the first part of like, public victory, by the way. Okay. So, so when you do, when you are proactive and when you do the first three practices, you move from a dependence to an independence, a stage of dependence to independence. Now you have to move from an independent stage to an interdependence, you know, a coexist in this world. So that's when the next three habits come in. Think with will seek to understand, then to be understood. Samastani nahi You often hear this, but I don't think you said this, right? I said this. Samastani nahi But slowly I realized that actually samasdhar may nahi so I didn't pick up on that. I think if you can try to practice this, and I'm sure the world you interact with would be a lot better. Does it make sense? I'm sure. Synergize, I think the more we talk about it, you, you end up getting the better results out of this. The world itself talks to itself. So if you practice good then think win-win, seek to understand that to be understood and synergize, I'm sure you'll get a good grip on the public victory and move you, help you move from independence to inter interdependence. And, and to encompass all this at the end of it, sharpen the saw. And here is where Stephen Covey very nicely talks about this, reinvest or relook at your four elements, your body, mind, heart and soul. Because these are the driving forces within you, which could probably help you with all this, or at the same time, you know, with many other things around the world you interact with. So, revisit time and again your body, your heart, your mind, and so on. And these are the ways of sharpening this off, and together you can leave better self mastery with the seven methods. And keep changing your paradigms, you know. On, from time to time. So what you see, what you do and what you get is everything within your platform. Okay? So I'll move forward from this concept of seven habits to the key competency which I said I strongly believe in and I'm sure it will make a lot of difference to your individual lives as coaching. What better playing field can we talk about coaching other than the soccer? Excellent coaching happens out there. So, you are going to be the driving forces for the organizations going forward. Please believe, this one competency can make a world of difference to you and to the other orders around you. There is again whole world of web which can tell you about what coaching is. I am not here to take you through a coaching session. But very important competency as individuals, you can make a lot of difference to your own self and to the world you interact with. I just wanted to leave you with one fact, one funda which I practice very often under this competency coaching is grow. When you are coaching somebody, take the grow model along with you. And what does grow talk about? Any idea? Never mind. Grow talked about goals, the reality check the options and a wrap up. So what are the goals your coaching needs to have? Help them achieve those goals. You don't do it yourself. Help them find their goals. When you practice as managers and when you are going to coach somebody as a leader, please have them allow or set up their own goals. And what kind of reality check? Where do they stand today vis-a-vis -vis the expected goals? The reality check is important to understand where do they stand. And once the reality check is done, what kind of options do we have to take ourselves forward from where we are at this point? So evaluate, help them evaluate the options. 
and wrap up with a beautiful development plan. So the entire coaching model can be driven forward. So the starting point of this goals and the end is a beautiful worked up plan to you know work towards a coaching assignment. So this is what I just wanted you to take home when I talked about coaching here and then we move a little forward. How far how are we as far as time is concerned? Okay, another 10-15 minutes. Good. Okay. Another important concept which I wanted to bring it in front of you is situation leadership. How many of you have heard about it? Okay, no surprise. Good. And did you have any formal training on situation leadership or you chance to you know sit through one of the sessions like here or read a book on it or what exactly is? Let me know about it. Can you be a little louder? Just through one of the sessions. Okay, okay. How did you, those, those who said you have heard about situation leadership in the past, how did they, you like this concept? Can I have some responses? Because the hands are plenty. Now point we are all learning, I am no expert on this, believe me, I am not a certified situation leadership trainer. So you can tell anything and we, we can together get away with it. Don't worry. Okay, so I will start uh, uh, talking about situation leadership. I think it, this is one concept again which made a lot of sense to me, you know, very early in my life. And it first evolved me to be a good manager and a leader subsequently. Okay. So the situation leadership is again, you know, you can talk for days together. But I just wanted to wrap up, wrap up talking something important from uh, this concept. It basically uh, talks about uh, the development level of an individual. You know, if you are a leader, obviously you are going to lead somebody. You are going to lead an individual. You are going to lead a team. You are going to lead something. So when you talk about you working with an individual and you have a, you need to understand the development level of the individual with respect to a task. That's an important reference. Okay? So if you have to understand the development level of an individual with respect to the task, you need to kind of place them into which quadrant do they belong to. Are they D1, D2, D3 or D4? You know what D1, D2, D4 specifies is clearly. I don't have to read it for you. But it's important to understand what development level they are. Because once you understand the development level, you get into this quadrant of the four leadership styles. So you have the quadrant, I'm sorry, the quadrant S1, which is, uh, which has a, from a leader perspective, you have a very, this is the directive behavior on the, this axis and the supportive behavior here. So you have in S1 a very high directive behavior and a low supportive behavior. So this, the skill or the, the competency which you use here would be a directing kind of a competency because it's got a high directive and the le development level of the individual should have been at D1 where he has got a low competence and a low commitment. So what happens if somebody has got a low competence and a low commitment? You, if you see his attitude, the attitude is, you know, fine, okay, and you don't see any kind of uh, uh, lead from the individual. So the style of leadership you will have to use here would be a very directive kind of, you say, you just execute and I am going to direct you what to do, how to do, how to go on with the things. So the leadership style there is a directive kind of a leadership style. And if you look at the second level, of an development, which is D2, who's got some kind of competence and very low, again, commitment levels. But competence make a difference here. And it could be, you know, matched with the S2 level of leadership style, which is a coaching leadership style. Again, coaching an important element here, which has got high directive and high supportive behavior. So there's a lot, the competence is already there. Commitment is required to be driven. So you have to do a lot of hand-holding to this individual through coaching. 
allow him, brainstorm, allow him to set his own goals, look at, allow him to do a reality check, let him evaluate the options he has in front of him, he or she has in front of him, allow him to develop desired desire, uh, development plan. So you need to coach the individual and help him move forward with the second leadership style that is coaching leadership style. To so make some sense, I know this is such a huge concept, it's difficult to talk in five minutes, but the purpose of bringing this in front of you is something which I personally achieved by practicing this. So I thought if we can go back and invest more time on it when you are practicing managers and leaders, I'm sure it will help you a lot. That's the purpose behind sharing this. But no intention to teach you the whole concept, believe me. Yeah? Ha, the support in the sense is, uh, you know, I can't be uh, overly nice to you by saying, uh, go, get yourself, uh, understand that, or do this, you will be successful. I would say that this is how it has to be done, right? It's more of a directive behavior, saying that you don't bother how to go about with it, I am telling you how to go about with the task. Go ahead and do that. But again, it doesn't see that you are zero sum of support. The human element is always going to be there. And again, an important thing here, good that you raise this question. Believe me, this is task dependent. On certain tasks, the individual would be at a D1 level of development. On a different task, you would have been at D2, D3, D4, as well. Right? So you will have to play around with those skills. Am I clear? So at S3 level, you are offering a supporting kind of a, uh, intervention because he falls under a D3 level of uh, development level. So you offer a high supportive gear and low directive. You would here tell him to do certain tasks. You would probably help to give a brainstorm. So you would ask him, how, to, how do you think we can go about with this? You know, you kind of probe into him and give thoughts and ideas from his side and then you know help him to kind of connect those dots and move forward. So it's very little of directive here and more of a supportive kind of behavior. Again, task dependent. Right? And then the last one is about delegating. This guy has this high in competence and high in commitment levels. I wouldn't talk about delegating. Imagine if you are directing this guy, what would happen? Heavens will fall. Yeah, crash. Maybe the best word. So, at least ensure that, you know, it is, since it's task dependent, identify the development level of the individual and bring in the right leadership style. That's what situation leadership talks about. And I'm grateful to Paul Mercy and Ken Blanker, who are innovators of this model as early as 1960s. And Ken Blanker is somebody, if you have read this book, One Minute Manager, beautifully written, small volume, beautiful concept. And if you, if, if you see this, it finally says the leadership style should correspond to the development style of the follower. And please note it, it is the leader who adopts. Another paradigm which I want you all to change. So all this while, you know, you, we would have been in the, under an impression or perception that you know the coaching or the the follower has to adopt. It is the other way around. The leader has to adopt because it's got four styles to play around from depending upon the development level of the individual. So I would suggest that if you feel there is some sense to what I have talked in these last two slides, please dedicate some time and please invest on this wonderful model and I am sure it will help you a lot. My last slide, and I think we are good at time management for a change. This is something which I I thought for a long time and then put it on the on the on the board. Uh, as I was speaking to Madhu sir, and I figured out that a lot of you come from five to fifteen year range of experience, and I'm sure during this period you would have developed a lot of skills and competencies, right? Yes, sir. You come for a beautiful program, what would be the life after that? You have a choice of going back 
and taking your skills and competencies to the next level. Existing skills and competencies or try to lay your hands on different skills and competencies. Possibility? Yeah? So, whenever and wherever you start, please decide what are those few things on the canvas I can lay my hands on. Don't try to grab everything at once. Pick up those few things. The reason for picking up those few things could be probably you're passionate about those, those areas. The choice criteria could be anything. But pick up those few things, decide what those things could be, and then you dedicate your time, energy, and everything behind it. Put everything behind that. Once you decide and once you dedicate your time and energy, and I'm sure you will have a lot of dividend out of it. Not from the investments which we make elsewhere. This is the investment which we make on ourselves and the environment which we interact with. After you decide the right things and dedicate your time and energy, you, you get the dividend out of it. There is a lot of learning experience, learning from that. So take care of that, reinvest that on the next set of decision points which you are going to work upon. Dedicate time on that and get dividends out of it and make this as a continuous evolving cycle. And this is one thing which I want you to carry home because it will immensely help you rather than shooting on the blackboard or trying to you know, uh, doing the best with everything and everything, anything around you. Okay, so this is something which I wanted to put forward before you and a big thank you for patiently hearing me. in front of you today and have uh, purpose meaningfully spent this time. So while I wish you all the very best, this is something which I recently, a day or two ago, I picked it up from LinkedIn. So I found it, I carried this all the way to you. The image is quite expressive. So I'm, I'm available for you for any Q&A. And Pradeep told me, you know, if the speaker is good, the Q&A's are good. So I hope this is a dipstick for me, you know. <laughs> yeah, please, the first time. You want a mic? You were talking about a win-win situation, so uh, you said that you know, although it is not a practical reality, you know, uh, it is possible that you can uh, make people happy. But my question is, in most of the situations, you cannot make everyone happy, right? So around you, because uh, different people have different perspectives of things, and they might not understand your perspective. Doing such a situation. So, good question. Um, I'll give you one story which probably connects with this one. I've read it long back. It made a lot of sense to me. The father had to divide uh, a piece of cake between two of his children. So, how would you go about you know, dividing that? So, there are multiple options. Either he cuts and gives it, so one of them will be unhappy saying that, you know. You give a bigger piece to X and a, or a smaller one to Y and kind of stuff. So he very nicely put it, he said, uh, one of you have a chance to cut the cake and the other one has a chance to pick up, make the choice first. So what would be the outcome? Best interest of both of them, right? So uh, I, as I told you, it's not always possible. And at the same time, I'm optimistic and I'm saying it is not even, it's not impossible. So, best way probably to negate this is, uh, uh, is trying to understand the expectation of the other person and uh, do your best and do uh, have a feedback, cross check, you know, if you've been able to meet up to the expectation to the larger extent. And this could happen even at home, not only at the professional environment, it could happen at home also. 
So the only idea is with this beautiful practice and habit, if you can kind of marginally raise the bar, say if you have a 30 percentile today and you make it to 30 percentile of success, 48, you're still growing. I think the world around you would be better. I can't give you a direct answer to this, but this is probably what you can make sense of. Yeah. So you talk about situational leadership, uh, but if in an organization I talk about a situational leadership in an organization and if uh, it is not trickling down and if we go up the pyramid and as uh, employees of the organization we feel that it is not trickling down to the senior leadership and it would become more effective if they follow this kind of a pattern, then what is it that the people at the bottom of the pyramid can do to make it more inclusive because this is obviously an effective way of uh, you know, uh, leading an organization. So how do the people who are more aware about such leadership traits can you know move, I mean, pass the message of the pyramid? I don't know if uh, culturally we still can do that, but all I can say if you become manager and leader tomorrow, ensure that you practice it. Don't forget those which you picked up, that I could say, but yeah. Uh, there is something called as reverse mentoring. I do believe in this and I have allowed many of my colleagues, my team members do that with me. They were shy, they were doubtful what would happen to my performance appraisal if I give a feedback and do something like this. Probably this is a technique this guy is using to get to know what they feel about me. But I strongly believe in that I had to do a lot of work to ensure that they come out openly and give me inputs and they guide, guide me and it helps. It helps. So again, uh, culturally, you know, if, what kind of uh, environment the organization practice, it depends a lot on that. And I think uh, I had a very good stint with multinationals in the past and uh, I'm biased against multinationals because my corporate's experience on the contrary has been even good. But I, multinationals do come with an edge in terms of, you know, Having a very good environment around these guys. Thank you, sir. I just had a follow-up question, so I will just make it very simple and clear. If I think my manager is micromanaging, is it okay for me to go to the appraisal discussion and tell him that you know this is the way I would like to be led by you, or this is not the way I would not be like to be led? I mean, because this is a, a real life situation that we have faced. Well, um, it's it's a double-edged sword. If you're prepared, you will carry your resignation in your pocket. <laughs> Go ahead and do that. Uh, that's on the lighter side, but I would say that, uh, you know, uh, play by the day, you know. Uh, some of the leaders, I think the leaders are evolving these days. And they are young leaders who are quite open to feedback. So if you have some, an individual who is micromanaging, uh, because that's what probably understood uh, from his leaders in the past, and he is approachable, he or she can be talked to, make an attempt, but don't keep uh, pestering them. You are not understanding, you know, so seek to understand them to be understood, probably there. But make an attempt and if you are successful, the world around you changes. Because it is important for that individual also that he improves on the high, high side. Yeah? Um, uh, sir, we talk about leadership in such good light, but is it always a time to be a follower? Because in many situations, in the, when you work in great organizations, good business at the top, you have to follow and sometimes blind it. If so, if following is also good, then what kind of principles or trade do you see in a follower? Okay, if I understood your question, um, you know, you always have different hats. Like you are a leader, leader in uh, context and you are also follower else, follow elsewhere. Uh, I will give you, uh, how many of you all have, please sit down. How many of you all heard, have heard Dr. T.V. Rao? Yeah. Uh, do you know Dr. T.V. Rao? Yes. Yeah? yes I, I chance to, uh, you know, work very closely with him at Ahmedabad because uh, we stay in the same town. And you know, uh, an organization if I am a leader or within the group, uh, my peer group if I take a leadership kind of an approach, 
But when I'm in front of Dr. T, you know, I'm an obedient follower. So you have to, you know, that's why your, your cycle is also evolving. You know, an individual goes through these phases. You're a father, you're a, you're a husband, you're a son. So you are playing multiple hats at the same time. So you will have to take negate yourself through these steps at all times. But one important thing which I understand from your question is you should never forget to learn. Because the day you close your doors for learning, you will, you will make a mess with all these elements of your life, whether it's a leadership or a follower trait. Have you been able to answer it? No, okay is not a good uh, <laughs> situation. So, uh, I, I, yeah. You talked about initiatives like uh, and, uh, reverse mentoring. So, right. I think it's in line with that itself. Like, uh, I was looking like any, any other such traits or any other such habits that people develop over a period of time. Okay. Yeah, I think for the, this moment, I think this is what I recall. It's something, again, you know, what comes at top of your mind is when you are actually practicing that. So, reverse mentoring is something which I, I thoroughly do. Yeah. Sir, I see that you do your uh, doctorate in philosophy. Can you relate the philosophy to HR, how you are practicing and shed some light on the thesis that you are doing? Ha! Good. I knew somebody would ask me about this. Okay. Uh, the uh, HR is something which I figured out much later in my life that I think this is an area which I belong to. So I kept on investing a lot on you know, uh, my capabilities and understanding about HR. And at some point, you know, uh, this was an accident which happened to me. Gujarat Technological University was uh, conducting a HR summit fundamentally to, you know, promote research within their uh, uh, the faculty group. So I was invited to speak on uh, in the forum and uh, I touched upon a few elements in, in that forum and, and then uh, the Vice Chancellor and many other professors there felt that I had a very good bent of research mind and uh, they made me mentor to a couple of groups. And I looked back and I said, I don't have a doctorate with me. I don't have a tag. But that was just a beginning. And I figured out that doctorate is something which should come and <coughs> fall into your lap if you actually go through a process or a procedure. So I said, why don't I get myself into a research activity. I thought for a while and then an interesting topic came into my mind, analytics. Because within our organization, we have a clear, we, we are into retail, right? We support a retail organization. And like, analytics is a bread and butter for our promoters to decide where are we and how we are at any given point. So I figured out that, you know, uh, I started developing interesting interest in analytics. So I connected HR with analytics and then it took me to a different dimension that there is a world of human capital analytics and it is evolving and we are still at the nascent stage. I saw about good work happening internationally about human capital analytics and very little of it in India. So I said let me pick up my work in this area. That, that was the starting point and then I think uh, I just submitted my uh, synopsis and uh, it's, it's been approved and I have to start my work no sooner or later. And uh, maybe a year and a half or two down the line, you could see my publication somewhere and I can more confidently talk about it going forward. Similarly, I would strongly advocate, I think today in our educational system, this is, a, a PhD is at, its, it's at the helm of things, <coughs> you feel your, your knowledge, your passion and your work should get to the best try to take up this area sometime in your life. I'm 44 and I don't mind investing on that because I'm an inspiration to my kids as well. But if this old fellow can read at this age, we will bloody well read at this age. So that's a reverse mentoring again, the other way around. Okay. Yes sir, good morning, Shobhanto. Uh, this is a personal one regarding your own career. And please uh, pardon me the liberty to ask you this question. Sir, you shifted your domain from sales and marketing to HR and I suppose during the interview you have faced this question, why did you, how do you fit into HR? Mr. Madhu, we were talking about it, right? 
So what was your answer to that? For a reason to say personally, you know, I mean, uh, you know, you began with the end in mind. So I'm, I'm there. Personally, let me talk to you. It was an accident. I got into training and development as my first footage into HR. And uh, I thought it's going to be a huge accident. And in about three months' time, I figured out that you know I belong to this place. <coughs> when that first assignment came in, and I, I was not sure if I could. I was. I had good presentation skills, thankfully, from my schooling background and uh, a little bit of leadership role at school and class. I managed to, you know, uh, get onto the bus very early. So with the uh, reasonable presentation skills, I said I could talk to the group and talk my mind out. And believe me, I was a uh, BSc chemistry as my main and mathematics and physics as my ancillaries. But then, you know, at one point I stood up and ta started talking to people about anatomy and physiology. So I de developed my competencies and my first stint as training manager was I took a whole team, I transitioned a whole team. At Pfizer we were reorganizing our teams. So people were crisscrossing from one division into another division. So a lot of cross training which was required to happen and I was a lone resource in my zone who had to do all this bit of training in a week's time. So I managed to pull this out very nicely and that's it, man you are in there. So having done that, then I started investing heavily on training and development. That's when I came over here to get myself certified on managing the training function. This very institute has helped me out. This was in 2005. So I invested a lot and, and then I said I cut for more beyond training and development. And somewhere you know, uh, since I was part of training and development, I was aligned to the HR team and I got affiliated to the competencies and skills what HR is all around and then I moved into HR, got a degree for myself and that's how I am here. I would say that uh, I am still learning, honestly, and that's the reason why I am investing on my PhD as well. So I am sure another Several years from now, I will still continue to learn and I will take my practice to a different level. With respect to uh, people, did fear whether this guy will be capable of leading it, and uh, I only assured them that you know um, my spirit of continuous learning and acumen, since I came to that background of uh, mathematics with anatomy, so that story sold by itself, sold for itself, and you know you, a promise. The way you communicate with a lot of promise will help you help people invest on you. They can take the risk. Yeah? And uh, last but not the least, show them the results at the earliest. Uh, good. Uh, sir, uh, this is Abhishek Nath from uh, the DMP Bench. Uh, I have a follow up question on the lines of what Sananda asked. Uh, you were talking about the end in mind. So, in in a scenario where you have been changing, and a lot of us would uh, relate to that, that we have to be changing from the uh, careers in down the line. So, how do you keep that or, or build that energy? Because uh, in the end of change, ever changing future, how do you prepare for that end? How do you define that end statement? Okay, great. Good question again. Uh, whether changing uh, industry is, is good or limiting yourself to one industry and practice is good, I don't know what is right and wrong about it. Here is a Jigta Jagta case of somebody who is changing from pharma into sales and marketing into this. All I can blame is, you know, you need to spend a reasonable time where you are. Just because seven habits talk about begin in the end in mind and change is something which is continuous. Don't keep changing every year or two. You will not, you will go nowhere. You know? So, uh, probably in one's life, it could be one industry, it could be two industries or three. I don't know what is the right number. But if you have clear, visible track ahead of you, take it, put yourself and your whole effort on it. That much I can say. That's what I practice. Yeah? And see those goals clearly in your life. That's important. Uh, due to paucity of time, we are going to have the 
last question from Sophie. Uh, hi sir, this is Swati. Uh, sir, I have a question regarding the, uh, the future of your presence and uh, sir, I, what I understand from giving knowledge about future of is they have a different kind of uh, you know, human resource structure. They, like you have a uh, CPO, a chief people officer, then you have a chief lead officer and uh, I mean, there are different personalities you know, and these things. So I just wanted to uh, to know from you, like, uh, can you please throw some light on uh, how, what is the philosophy behind it and uh, how it is done exactly. Okay. Great. Uh, you mean, uh, I, I know the rest of you all know uh, Mr. Devdar Patnai. Yeah. It's actually Dr. Devdar Patnai. Yeah. How many of you all know he is actually a doctor? He is actually a doctor. Somebody who was picked up uh, you know, through his life about you know, um, this Gyan and somewhere I believe he and uh, Mr. Kishore Biyani happened to interact and Mr. Kishore Biyani found his, his practice and his world where it came inspiring, exactly connected with his way of thinking and his way of moving his organization, future group forward. So that's when he had him on board as uh, the post was not existing. So he had him reporting to him directly, but he created something called as chief belief officer. That's how Dr. Devdan Patai happens to be you know, existing. And I had very uh, good opportunity of interacting with him. We did some work together at some point. And uh, in terms of, uh, that's about this chief belief officer. But I'm uh, off late, I think he, he's set the tone in the organization. He's given, given his inputs and he's asked the team to move forward. I believe he is now focusing on different level of class and he is interacting with the outside world a lot of late. So that's what I understand from his own words very recently when I met him at Kolkata. And uh, it, with respect to chief people office, I think it's about uh, a fancy designation. At the end of it, you deliver the job. You have to, uh, uh, you have to deliver to the promise you make to the talent, the word talent. So actually you forgot to mention that, you know, uh, you must be wondering, this is a digital age, where did the talent age reference come from? You know, I was coming from more from, you know, come, compared to those years where, you know, it was, you know, mechanical and production intensive era. Today, you know, you have a talent intensive era, you know, with a lot of brain work going on. So I still say, talent age is something which is common and then you, get those verticals of digital age, etc, etc, all of that. So therefore, I prefer to point my, uh, the uh, talent age out here. Yep. So you will have to be committed to the word talent, in spite of having a fancy designation. This is just to impress your neighbors and the outside world they interact with. Honestly speaking, that's all. So what carries home? <laughs> your wife doesn't get I don't care you know, whether you bring in a car which has a chief people office or a HR executive. You know, something, you know, uh, I figured out, you know. Uh, that's how my paradigm changed. Uh, leadership, uh, in LinkedIn, you know, when you go into an update, something comes up prominently on the top. If you are an HR executive, then for some time I said, no, I'm not an HR executive. So I left beautiful things behind. The HR executive is a way of expressing that my dear HR folks. So I missed the bus. Then I figured out, you know, I'm also an HR executive, maybe at a different level, probably. So when I started looking into this links, I, I, I found out beautiful, interesting things being discussed out there. So don't get carried away with those beautiful fancy designations. You know, what you take home is important, actually, apart from this. <laughs> yeah. I'm done. So, do I qualify for a good session because good <laughs> Thank you so much. I have to say that. I have to say that. And I had a nice time being here. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for this inspiring and self uh, actuating session. Uh, now I will request Rakhi to uh, present the bouquet as a token of thanks and sir, apologies for the delay in the staff. <laughs> now I would request Mr. Madhu Mohan to present the uh, uh, memento as a token of thanks.
all out of So maybe we do all these things here, which I'm not used to it. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you. 